a forbidden love. I cannot believe you were 29. I was 16. A surprise investigation. It was assigned to one of my sex crimes prosecutors. And a tragic twist that will leave a family torn apart. <laughs> No matter how old she got, this was always one of Emily Morris's favorite places to be. <laughs> Sorry. It was here on her trampoline where the St. Louis, Missouri girl would often come to work through the extreme highs and lows that would come to define her life. Your daughter, who is she? She was all kinds of things that you hope your daughter would be, and then some. When she was younger, she was vivacious, she was... Uh, energy personified. And as Emily grew up, she found the perfect outlet for all that energy. Emily was a very gifted athlete. She was always very, very competitive. Then when Emily was around 14 years old, she joined her school's cross country track team at the encouragement of one of its coaches, a 28 year old teacher in his first year with the district named James Wilder. Wilder was this charismatic guy Everyone wanted to be around him. You know, everybody really liked him as a coach and uh, sort of valued the attention that they got from him. Under Wilder's guidance, Emily seemed to flourish, winning multiple awards for herself and the school. But then somewhere along the way, Emily seemed to get off track. It was, her family says, around her sophomore year of high school. I definitely noticed this, this big difference. She seemed just more closed off and irritable and and I talked with my parents about it and they'd say, well, this is just, you know, like this is just what happens when people become teenagers. But privately, Emily's parents were just as concerned. The change in Emily was massive and inexplicable. We weren't able to figure out what had happened, what was wrong. We tried therapy, we tried talking. She withdrew into herself and then she wouldn't say what, what the problem was, you know. So you had no idea? I had no idea. But Emily's parents say they were about to get one very big clue. Tell me about when you were called to the school. The principal at the time left a message on our phone that Emily had been accused of having an affair with a teacher. And not just any teacher, it was Coach Wilder, the accuser claiming they stumbled upon Wilder and Emily engaging in some sort of sex act at the local park. And my husband and I requested a meeting, and it consisted of James Wilder, Emily, my husband, and I in one room together. And it couldn't have been any more tense. Wilder's face was, was blotchy from the suspense. Emily looked straight ahead. Both Wilder and Emily denied the claims, and in the end, the school determined it was just a vicious rumor. After the meeting, no action was taken. Emily goes on to graduate and Coach Wilder continues teaching at the school. But then, roughly 10 years after that, Emily suddenly drops a bomb on family and friends, saying the allegations were all true. She was beginning to have problems and that's when we started to find out. And that's when I was stunned to find out how extensive. Emily's family claims she told them it all began when she was 15 and Wilder was 29 and that in the years since high school, she's been haunted by it all. Andrea, what's the significance of this place? Where are we? Well, this is Boar Park, so cross-country practices often took place here. And this is where she was first allegedly abused by Coach Wilder. How and where? Well, they played this game called chicken, where he basically dared her to put her hand on his leg and then didn't tell her to stop until she actually had his hand, her hand over his crotch. Emily would go on to claim that after that game, things got more serious with encounters between her and the married coach becoming a regular thing. In fact, Emily would even admit to carrying on the relationship after high school when she was a consenting adult, though her family says that makes little difference considering when things supposedly began. I mean, the reason it's illegal is because of this power issue. You can't ever have a regular relationship with a teacher. They can 
give you a detention. You know, they can get you in trouble. And so Emily's family encouraged her to go public, but by then she had a husband and two adoring kids she didn't want to drag through the mud. Not even when another girl suddenly comes forward with allegations of her own. This time, Wilder is arrested by police, but after finding no evidence to support the girl's claims, the charges are dropped and Wilder keeps his job. We have to go legally with what was found, and at that time there was there was no case made against him. Emily tries hard to move on after that, but her family says the former track star just couldn't outrun her demons. It had a terrible effect on her, on her psyche. Depression led to drinking and drinking to divorce. Emily's life was spiraling out of control, says good friend Christine Lieber. She said that, you know, in high school, her first sexual experience was with Coach Wilder. Wow. I think she went from being a child and being innocent and being young to being robbed by him of her innocence and her purity. And this was while her parents thought she was safe and mm -hmm. at school. Mm -hmm. An even harder pill to swallow for Emily's dad. I was a teacher, I was a guidance counselor, I was a principal. And your daughter was hurt at school mm -hmm. by another educator? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, how does that make you feel? Not well, not well. But Emily was determined to bounce back from rock bottom, and with her own kids growing older, the 33-year-old suddenly finds the courage to rise. Well, we were on the trampoline in her backyard, which was one of her favorite activities. She decided that she wanted to do something about it to make sure that nobody else endured the pain that she had endured the last uh, decade plus of her life. She said enough is enough. Mm -hmm. For over a decade, Emily Morris kept her allegations private. But then, at age 33 and with two kids of her own, Emily has a change of heart, finally deciding to go public with her claims. I mean, we had encouraged her for years to do this. I think, you know, she had endured enough pain over the years. She had enough, and she just said, I, I want to do this. Authorities take the claim seriously. They contacted us after doing some preliminary investigation, um, and it was assigned to one of my sex crimes prosecutors at about that same time. But investigators would need more than Emily's word alone. They needed evidence, and so the police gave her an uh, audio recorder, and she ended up going and meeting up with him. After several phone calls, Wilder finally agrees to meet with Emily in a parking lot of a local mall. Sorry to record you now, just hope this goes well. But the mission is almost over before it begins. Hey, how are you? Oh, sorry. You're not wired, are you? <laughs> Wilder is immediately suspicious, but Emily is quick to set his mind at ease. Can I just say, can I just tell you like the good news about things? Yeah. That I started seeing a new doctor and I'm on the medication and I just feel I feel normal for once. Emily tells Wilder she just wanted to meet because her new therapist suggested it might be helpful, but that only seems to make him more nervous. Maybe this doctor said, bust his <laughs> you no, know what I mean? he's not that kind of person. And After more coaxing from Emily, Wilder appears to relax. You know what, it, here, it's a weird deal because if you go 90% of the world, 15's legal. So if I go over and boff a 15 year old in Spain, I can do all day in the streets, whatever, and <laughs> nothing would happen. You touch a 16-year-old and you go to jail here. It wasn't an admission of anything, but Emily wasn't done. If what she claimed happened was true, she would need Wilder to discuss details. She was really good at, like you can tell, they kind of gave her hints about how to like guide to have him say certain things. You know, when I drove by the park and you know, like all the memories kind of like flood in. She's talking about the park where she asserts they had their first encounter playing that very adult game of chicken. So up in my, I look back, I'm like, what the was I thinking? But there were much more serious allegations than that. Emily claims not long after that game of chicken, Wilder drove her home and performed oral sex on the then confused and unwilling 15 year old girl. And you finally, still I did. Felt, I felt <laughs> not for very long. And I could tell by 
your <laughs> and I was like okay um what did I say do you really want to do this and I think you said no. I, I don't remember all I and remember I was like, is okay. going out in the trampoline I said and... let's go outside and you're like okay <laughs> and we went out there and once we got to the trampoline I felt like 2,000 times better I'm like okay so yeah it would have been kicked just to have had a non-sexual relationship at that time but Emily claims the married father could have stopped things and didn't. That the relationship continued for years, even after high school, when they were both consenting adults. We really didn't do much until you got to college. We did. I mean, we did something that wasn't right, according to our laws these days, right? But you know I'm not a creeper. I didn't creep. I didn't try and, let me see if I can get in her. No, we had never. You know what I mean? In fact, Walter seems to imply it was really Emily who kept things going. There were times I did not want to do anything because I just didn't think it was where we, what we should do, but we do it anyway. Yeah. And part of it, you're persuasive. And, you know, I do I want to make you mad? You'd get mad at me. And so like, okay, let's go, you know. And it wasn't like it hurt. <laughs> you know, it was, yeah. I did enjoy the end result. Soon after that comment, Emily tells Wilder she has to pick up her kids and ends the 87-minute recording, but not before Wilder seems to make it clear he wouldn't be opposed to reliving their past. Yeah, one of these days we will have to. I'm going to get in shape, and we will have to, just for fun. But that day will never come. Emily turns the recording over to authorities. And just weeks later, James Wilder is under arrest. After the, uh, the investigation went on, Mr. Wilder was uh, taken into custody, and we filed uh, six counts of statutory sodomy. Each count carries a uh, maximum penalty of up to seven years in the, uh, in the penitentiary. For 47-year-old James Wilder, a potential life sentence. For Emily Morris, an apparent turning point. She's in the best place I've ever seen her. I have so many wonderful pictures of our children and of us, and it, it couldn't have been better. We even have things that she wrote to friends that say, like, I feel like I'm finally getting somewhere and I'm finally able to heal now that we're starting to go forward to this. But going forward was really not so fast, with both sides arguing over the details of a potential plea deal for months. Our recommendation was that he be sentenced to the penitentiary for seven years, that he'd have to go through the uh, sex offender treatment program there. He would be a registered sex offender and have to register for life. Then, after nearly two years of legal wrangling, Emily tells loved ones she thinks they're finally close to resolution. She had said that she was either going to come to a conclusion or go to trial um, November 15th. Instead, November 4th, a Tuesday, after failing to reach his daughter on the phone, Emily's dad goes to her apartment. No answer. And when you got there, did you call out for her? Yeah. Her front door was locked. And so the, there was a back door. Uh, that was open and I went in and she was laying next to her bed. I said, Emily, what are you doing there? Let me help you up. And when I reached down, I knew she was cold. <laughs> She was 35 years old. Friends and family say 35-year-old Emily Morris was finally happy after the man she claims took advantage of her when she was just 15 was arrested and charged with six counts of statutory sodomy. She was very relieved to see that justice was finally going to be served in this case. And she was in a great place with her children, working out all the time, you know, emailing and daily texting. You know, this is how many days sober, and I mean, it was, she was in a great spot. Then, just weeks before, when the St. Louis mom tells loved ones the case is set to be resolved, Emily is found dead on her bedroom floor. My dad had found her first. She was laying on the ground um, in a blanket with a, her head in like a kitchen trash can, and it was 
like wedged up to her elbows. Was there blood around or what was the scene like? No blood or anything like that. When police arrive, the family tells investigators about Emily's pending case against James Wilder, her former track coach. But they also mention Emily's ex-husband, who, quote, pays a large amount of alimony and child care. And they tell cops about an ex-boyfriend with whom Emily had just recently broken up. So ultimately, was this a homicide investigation? I don't think they knew what they were looking into. In fact, though the initial police report does list Emily's death as suspicious, there were other clues pointing in other directions. Like the parents report that Emily had a cold the week before that had turned into an upper respiratory infection. And then there was the family's own admission that Emily had a history of alcoholism, coupled with the empty vodka bottle police found next to Emily's bed. I think that they assumed right away that this was uh, she overdosed on alcohol, and that was what we were told, basically, for the first couple months. The problem with that, she says? We got the autopsy report back, and the tax screen ended up being largely clear. Her blood alcohol level was just .048. Ultimately, medical examiners find the cause of death to be asphyxiation caused by the plastic trash bag in which her body was found. On the death certificate, they, the cause of death was suffocation and the manner of death was unknown. Meaning no one could say for sure just how Emily got into that trash can. We did reach out to the Baldwin Police Department for comment, and though they declined to be interviewed, they did tell us in part, during the investigation, detectives worked closely with the St. Louis County Medical Examiner's Office, and the case was closed after a thorough investigation and review of the medical examiner's report with signs pointing to the death being accidental in nature. Uh, it does not appear there was any foul play. But then Emily's family also says that no matter how she died, what happened after was almost as shocking. Remember those charges Emily fought so hard to bring against her former track coach? At the funeral, we were let known that the charges against Wilder were dropped. You heard right, all six counts thrown out. There's a law that you have to be able to face your accuser. Since she passed away, uh, Wilder wasn't able to face her in court, and so he was released of all charges. Even though police had 87 minutes of Wilder's own words captured covertly by Emily before she died. We did something that wasn't right according to our laws these days, right? But you know I'm not a creeper. So the problem that we had is once Emily tragically passed away, although we had a statement from Wilder essentially acknowledging the relationship, in Missouri that's not enough to make the case. Um, we have to be able to prove that the crime occurred and without her testimony that was just not possible. A hard fact to accept for Emily's grieving loved ones. And if she's no longer alive, and so that's it. So with Emily's death, so went the case? Exactly. He has zero charges against him. He is free to do whatever he wants. But we wanted to get Wilder's take on this story, so we went to his home to try to get some answers. Mr. Wilder? Hi, Mr. Wilder. Nurse and Mike with Crime Watch Daily. I have a question for you regarding Emily. Sir, sir, Mr. Wilder, do you have anything to say to Emily Morris's family regarding the allegations against you? No response, and we wouldn't be getting one anytime soon. As you can see, James Wilder ran into his home through his garage, and when we announced who we were, he had nothing to say about that or the allegations. Not long after that, Crime Watch Daily did finally receive a statement from Wilder's attorney, Scott Rosenblum, who maintains his client is innocent, and told us, quote, we were absolutely ready to defend the case, and we felt good about the defense. It's a complicated story to be sure. With Emily's death and Wilder not talking, we may never know for sure what really happened between the two. So for now, Emily's family does their best to process a number of difficult emotions. The guilt of not seeing the alleged pain she was in sooner and the sorrow of no longer having her around.
you just don't know. It leaves you so damn empty. What needs to happen now? What should happen? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter how I feel. She's dead. She'll never come back. What's the hardest part been? You know, she was so close, and I think this could have been so good for her to finally reach the end of this this torture that she felt about something that happened so long ago. How do you handle not only the loss of your sister, but knowing that the thing that she was trying for the hardest went away because of her death?